Thank you very much. So it's uh, delightful to be here. I can't really see any of you with the brightness of the lights, but I'm, I'm, I'm just focused on these guys then. That'll work for me. Uh, I have not given a speech with slides in 15 years. So one, uh, these are really old slides. Um, <laughs> uh, more relevantly, uh, we'll see how it goes. The name of my talk is The Rise of the Different, Why the Global Order Doesn't Work and What We Can Do About It. The global order doesn't work. I think that's obvious. We, we live in what I call a G0 world, not a G7, not a G20. You look around the world today, look at Europe, and it's very clear that while the United States is prepared to send Secretary Geithner over and over to dispense advice, he's not writing any checks. And when French President Sarkozy went to China and said, how about some support, uh, the response from the Chinese was not no, um, but hell no. Uh, if the Europeans are going to get through this crisis, as I believe they ultimately will, they will get through it themselves. Afghanistan. The United States is leaving Afghanistan. Around 2014, uh, the country will fall apart. Uh, and when I spoke to some Chinese officials recently and I asked them, you know, the, the Brits have done Afghanistan, the Soviets, the Americans, isn't it your turn? Uh, the response was, no, uh, we don't want to get involved. Uh, look at Syria. It's been over 18 months. We have over 30,000 dead. And uh, the likelihood of any resolution from anyone uh, is, uh, uh, is, is really not in front of us. If Putin really wanted to make Obama's day, he could say, you know, I've had a change of heart. We have real problems uh, on the ground in Syria. I see the humanitarian devastation. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my mind. I will support anything you want to do in the Security Council. So what would you like to do? And then Obama would say, well, I wanted to blame you. But it's very clear that we're not going to see resolution of Syria either. And if you look at global institutions, the Doha round on trade is dead. Uh, climate, we've had now Copenhagen and Durban, right, and Rio plus 20. How, how many more failed global summits on climate do we need to have before we understand that we stop having global summits on climate? I was at Columbia University uh, with some of my students the other day, and I asked them this question, and one of my students gamely raised his hands, and he said, seven, which I thought was a pretty good answer. I mean, you know, two or three is probably not enough, but by the time you get to 10, it gets a little silly. Seven seems like enough failed additional global climate summits before we should probably stop. So, look, we are in this environment. It's very clear, and it's very different world order from the one we had over the past decades, the old world order was led by the United States. Uh, when we came out of World War II, we had Bretton Woods on currency, we had the World Bank, we had the IMF, um, we had the United Nations. They sound global. The World Bank sounds global. The World Series sounds global, right? <laughs> there is a Canadian team. It's not global. And, and this is the point, is that all of these institutions were created by the United States with American allies, American values, American priorities, American capital, and that was the order. You could call it a G7 or a G20, but in reality it was a G1+. Plus. That order is gone. What replaces it? Why have we lost it? I think that there are three reasons, and I'm going to focus on one in particular today. The first is that the United States doesn't want to do as much as they have historically. I don't know, did any of you see the foreign policy debate on the U.S. presidential candidates a week ago? I apologize. <laughs> You're never getting those 90 minutes back, right? They're just, they're just gone. Um, but, of course, what they agreed on was that they didn't want to respond to foreign policy questions. What they agreed on was that they wanted to do nation building at home. The average American is less interested in, in being the global policeman. They're less interested in being the lender of last resort. They are less interested in leading and directing globalization. Second major region is that the Europe and 
Japan, America's major allies, uh, don't want to do this either. They are busy. They are distracted. It's very clear that for the last three years, the Europeans have been maximally distracted by crisis. That's not going to change. Japan, we've had now 18 governments in 22 years, modern-day Asian record. It's about to be 19 in 23. They've had the Fukushima crisis. The Japanese aren't going to do it. That's reason number two. Reason number three are all of these new countries. The rise of the rest, or more relevantly, the rise of the different. So if you look back to 1980, and you look at where the world was in 1980, it is very clear, and it's the old order that we all know. The United States is number one, and going along the top 10 economies, you have all of those G7 countries. Look at Japan, Germany, France, UK, Italy, Canada. And then when you get to 8 to 10, you've got countries that are really close. Mexico, taking advantage of the American economy just across the border, driven completely by the US economy. Trade, remittances, tourism, drugs, it's all US. Um, Spain part of Europe, Argentina, the most Europeanized of the Latin American countries. That's where we were in 1980. Where are we today? Top 10 economies today. Look at the change. Look at how China's number two. Look at Brazil. Look at Russia. Look at India. We've got the BRICS. Where's Canada? Gone. Sorry, Canada. Canada's off the list. So it happens. You know, data-driven. Canada's gone. So that's where we are today. But I said this isn't just the rise of the rest, it's the rise of the different. The fact that they are different makes life harder. How are they different? Here's one way. They're poor. If you add the combined per capita incomes of Brazil, Russia, India, and China, you are still lower than the per capita income of the United States of America. The Chinese will be the first to tell you, yes, we're going to become the largest economy in the world, but when we do, we will still be a poor country. Their priorities will be different. They will be much more internally focused. Their levels of political stability are necessarily lower. The volatility that they are impacted by when shocks hit their countries are necessarily greater. The fact that all of these new countries around the table have fundamentally different qualities of life and fundamentally different priorities for their citizens doesn't make them bad, it makes them different. And we have a harder time politically integrating and cooperating with different. It's one of the biggest challenges in the world today. What else? Let's look at capabilities, foreign aid. Look how extraordinarily different. You want to look at it from a planetary perspective. The USA is the sun and the BRICS are Neptune, Pluto. I mean, $214 billion. Okay, the US is still the biggest game out there. But Great Britain, 26. The BRICS combined, $3 billion in foreign aid. Does that mean they're bad? No, it means they haven't done this before. So here's a statistic for you. India has $1.1 billion people. New Zealand has 4 million. Their numbers of diplomats, foreign service officers, are the same. Now, we don't look to New Zealand for a lot of support on global trade. We don't look to them for a lot of support on climate. We don't look to them to really help move the needle on nuclear nonproliferation. And yet we expect India to do this. Why? Because they're so big. But they're not. Their capabilities, when you look at how long they've been global and how much time they've had to develop the institutions and the bureaucracies, it's not just that they don't want to agree on many of these issues. Not that they have different priorities and different systems, but it's also that they don't have the capacity. How long have there been active international philanthropy in Britain or in Canada or across Europe or in the United States? Does Russia have that yet? The answer is no. How long have we had multinational corporations that know how to work globally in the advanced industrial economies? 
The Indians aren't there yet, nor the Brazilians, nor the Chinese. They're getting there. It's incredibly impressive to look at how much they've grown, but we have to understand how radically different in capacity and interests the other countries that matter around the world are today. Look at share of global military expenditure. The United States, of course, is number one. What a lot of you may not know is that the United States spends more on defense than the world's 10 next economies added up. Now, I'm not suggesting that's sustainable. I'm not suggesting that it's right and proper for the United States to keep spending that amount of defense globally. I think a lot of Americans are having that discussion right now. But what is very clear is that if you want to really burden share and say, well, the world order is changing, so many other countries should be providing that level of security that the US used to, you look at the numbers and you realize that's not happening. It looks more like a G0. Global competitiveness. Look at the ease of doing business in different countries. The United States is four, UK is seven. Look at the BRICS. 91, China. And they're the best of the BRICS in terms of doing business rankings. How about the brain drain? UK is four, US is five. Of course, you know, it was four and five in the other direction, then Ted started organizing in Oxford, and now that just tipped it to the other direction. <laughs> but even here, Brazil 27, Russia 111. The best universities in the world overwhelmingly in the United States and in the advanced industrial economies. Yes, it's starting to change. There are three Chinese institutions now in the top 100. There are none, there are none from India. It's changing, it's changing slowly. We need to recognize where we are today. Okay, so I think I've made the point that the new emerging markets that are sitting with us around the table and are critical to understanding how the world will or will not be led are fundamentally different from the advanced industrial democracies. At least can we say that the emerging markets themselves have a lot in common, that they will become more coherent as a group? The answer is no. Let's compare the BRICS. Let's look first of all at systems of government. The Brazilians and the Indians are democracies. The Russians and the Chinese, not so much. How about energy? The Russians and the Brazilians are energy exporters. The Indians and the Chinese, not so much. How about the economy? Well, Brazil, India, and China have fairly diversified economies, and you see that in terms of what they manufacture, the consumer sectors, levels of imports. Russia is a petrostate, not so much diversity. Demographics, China, Russia, and Brazil, Urbanized and strongly urbanizing. India, 31% of the population is in cities. That's compared to about 50% in Africa. Not so much. Finally, neighborhood. India, China, Russia, all being buffeted by difficult and getting worse geopolitical conflicts. Brazil is in a geopolitical neighborhood where they don't have to deal with this stuff. They've got Chavez in Venezuela. Who's near death? That's about it. Um, I say this because fundamentally, if you look at the kinds of things that might create shared interests, you look at how we went, the world order went from Great Britain to the United States, and how similar those countries are, how similar our countries are in terms of all of these kinds of points that matter to the way you govern and what you hold dear, and you realize that within the emerging markets, the differences are profound. They are at least as great as they are between emerging markets and the advanced industrial democracies. How about size of economy? At least we can say they're relatively similar in terms of what they can and can't accomplish. Well, as you see, here we have India, $1.95 trillion. Russia, exactly the same size. Brazil's a little bigger. 
2.4. And then we have China, 8.25. Actually, the Chinese economy is bigger than the other three bricks put together. Can anyone please explain to me why we ever thought we should have this as a grouping? Let's go further. Can anyone please explain to me why anyone thought we should add South Africa to this grouping? <laughs> Which is roughly the size of the sixth largest province in China. These countries have nothing in common. We cannot look to the developing world and say, what do you guys want? Who would you like to be the head of the World Bank? How would you like to do climate? What do you want for a global energy accord? How should we handle nuclear proliferation? No, it's not going to happen. So there they are, the four plus one, the five bricks all lined up. And now we think about global governance and global leadership. And what do we have? We have a football tournament. That's what we have. We've got 20 nice countries. They're great flags. They can compete in sports. They have nothing in common. And then we can look at 27 countries in Europe that are a little bit busy right now, even a better football, I mean, certain tournament in terms of capacity, but not in terms of actual leadership. So what do I mean by it? What is my takeaway from all this? Because at the beginning, I did say why the global order doesn't function and what we can do about it. Well, number one thing we can do about it in 18 minutes, number one thing we can do about it um, is we recognize it. Number one thing we do about it is we understand it. We don't pretend. We stop doing global when global doesn't work. We cannot allow, I said this at the beginning on global climate summits, we cannot allow the great to be the enemy of the good. We can't pretend that the great will work and allow us to continue to have meetings that fail and as a consequence, don't try things that will work but they won't work as well. On trade, this is starting to happen. US-led global architecture is dead. Going forward, you will either have global architecture that is not U.S.-led or you will have U.S. and other led architecture that is not global. I suggest we go that way. We go narrower and we go deeper. In the trade, you have the idea of a trans-Pacific partnership that the United States is working on with Canada, Mexico, and a bunch of like-minded countries on trade in Asia. Japan, Australia, Singapore. You put them all together, 12 countries, you'll get 40% of the world's GDP with stronger, tighter trade architecture. It's better than nothing. China will not be invited, nor will Russia. Why? Because they don't actually agree with all these other countries on how international trade should be structured, on rule of law, on an independent judiciary. But over time, if you build a strong tighter, more durable economic integration, the potential that as China gets wealthier and as their interests become a bit closer, that they will want to join such an institution go up. But if you wait, if you try to keep doing global instead, we will get nothing. That will be true on climate. That will be true on security. If there's one thing we can do beyond simply recognizing that we are presently in a G0 where global leadership is lacking, it is to understand that smaller, less exciting, less ideal, but more capable and more durable coalitions of the willing on economic issues in particular are the way forward. In this environment especially, we owe it to ourselves to do that. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.